good afternoon or good morning or good other time of the day, depending upon where you are. Um, <clears throat> so on behalf of the Biochemical Journal, the Biochemical Society and Portland Press, and on this occasion, the Biochemical Journal, I'd like to welcome you to today's webinar, which is part of our biochemistry focus webinar series. Topics in this series include different research areas in the molecular biosciences, as well as practical sessions uh, to support career development. And each of the webinars will give you the opportunity to ask questions via text. And we welcome suggestions too for future topics and speakers to feature in our webinar series. Please see the, uh, the website you can see on the bottom left, um, uh, Society website for, um, for more details. And so my name is Mark Lemon. I'm a professor of pharmacology at Yale University and uh, I used to be chair of biochemistry and biophysics at UPenn before I moved to Yale. Um, and I'm also um, a co-director of the Cancer Biology Institute at Yale. <clears throat> and my role with respect to the society is to chair the editorial board of the Biochemical Journal. Um, so a special welcome from me. Um, <clears throat> and uh, today's uh, webinar is entitled um, Tackling SARS-CoV-2 Biochemistry. And it's um, run as part of Biology Week. This session is focused on the collection of seven original papers that we published in the Biochemical Journal, where John Diffley and his colleagues, from whom you'll hear in a few minutes, um, present the findings for seven, for all seven actually, of the uh, of the non-structural um, SARS-CoV-2 enzymes, the enzymes that are responsible for replication of the virus. So I'd just like to say a few words about the Biochemical Journal. I took over as chair of the editorial board at the beginning of January this year, um, and I'd been associated with the journal for a long time. It's a, a journal um, with a, a, a terrific uh, scientist group that runs it in terms of editorials and so forth. And our, our mission broadly is rigorous understanding of molecular mechanisms in biology, which is at the core of the biochemical journal. And as a journal, we play a key role in advancing understanding through publication of high impact research in 21st century biochemistry. And we're in the process at the moment of adding a variety of elements of 21st bio century biochemistry, including new systems biology section and so forth, and, and themed review issues. Um, so look for some changes over the next little while. Um, many advantages to the journal. I actually, actually just had a, publish, a paper published there um, a couple of weeks ago, which was remarkably efficient compared with other papers that we're publishing elsewhere. Quick decision, free to publish using a standard license, no page fees, uh, publication charges or color fees. Um, and um, open access uh, with no author facing fees using the read and publish offerings that more and more institutions are taking. But the key thing that we try to advocate and do is painless publishing. We're, unlike other journals, we won't get you to do experiments that I know reviewers have a whim that you should do. So extra experiments not necessary to the paper will not be asked for, which actually makes publishing, um, to publish your paper. Um, and um, it, uh, rapid um, listing in Medline and, public, in, and uh, et cetera. And, um, and it's an independent society owned journal for your biochemical society. So, um, so next, uh, let's uh, just let me introduce the subject of today's um, webinar, which is, as I said, tackling SARS CoV 2 biochemistry. And the beginning of the COVID-19 pan pandemic launched a race across the world to produce effective vaccines and other therapeutics. Several of the vaccines have now been rolled out with remarkable speed and, and um, effectiveness. But we all know that frequent emergence of SARS-CoV-2 variants um, serve as an important warning that this is going to be an ongoing battle with vaccines, the needs for vaccines will change. Um, new generations of vaccines will be required. And what's, what's also clear is that effective antiviral compounds are going to be crucial tools in the long-term armory against newly emerging vi um, virus variants. Now, to meet this challenge during the 2020 COVID-19 lockdown and to take advantage and to make the most of that time, John Diffley and his colleagues, both at the Crick Institute in London and the University of Dundee, retooled their laboratories during that period to identify some new small molecule inhibitors of the enzymes that are required for replication of the SARS-CoV-2 virus. They focused on pre-existing pharmaceuticals in doing this with the hope that the inhibitors that they find would be deployed rapidly. 
in the response to COVID-19. And um, we just published um, a couple of months ago a collection of seven original papers in the Biochemical Journal describing the findings for seven of these SARS-CoV-2 non-structural enzymes. And this collection describes several drug candidates that will serve certainly as important starting points for further development and or tool compounds for studies of the vagaries of this virus that's terrorizing us all at the moment. And so during this webinar, the speakers will describe the biochemical screens that they use to identify inhibitors of the SARS-CoV-2 encoded enzymes. John Diffley will begin by providing an overview of the project. Jennifer Milligan will then describe the screen for um, NSP5 slash um, pro inhibitors. Kang Wei Tan will then describe um, work leading to the NSP3 PL Pro screen. Berta Canal will describe uh, screens for NSP um, non structural protein 14, 10, and 15. And uh, Raquel Ufer will then describe how she tested the inhibitors um, that were um, set, um, <coughs> identified for those approaches in viral growth assays. Um, now, um, so, so that's our, our list of speakers. Before I hand over, to John to get the, um, the the talks kicked off. I'd just like to mention a little bit of um, housekeeping in terms of submitting questions. And the questions will be asked at the end of the webinar, not between talks. Um, but please don't, do send your questions in at any time. <clears throat> so if you have a question, if you could type it in the question box as shown here um, on the figure. And, um, and and uh, and then if you could specifically state to for who who your question is for, and we'll try to answer as many as we can at the end. They'll come through in a little box to me and Sandra, and then we can uh, the chair the art the um the asking and answering of the questions by the by the panelists. So 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 that, I hope that um, makes sense. Um, and um and your questions I should point out will only be visible to the organisers. Um, so, uh, uh, so you were just you will be distributing across to everybody. Okay, good. So I think that's everything. <clears throat> I think we can um, now get started. And um, the first of our invited speakers today is uh, Dr. John Diffley. John was born and raised in the New York City area, where I currently am actually uh, today. Um, he obtained his BA. MS and PhD from NYU, New York University, and then worked as a postdoctoral fellow in Bruce Stillman's laboratory at Cold Spring Harbor from 84 to 90, where he started working on yeast DNA replication. John then moved um, to the UK to Clare Hall Laboratory's Imperial Cancer Research Fund in 1990 as a junior group leader, was promoted to senior group leader in 95, and became director of the Clare Hall Laboratories and deputy director of the London Research Institute for the CRUK in 2006. Then with the founding of the Quick, the Francis Quick Institute in 2015, John became Associate Research Director with Responsible for Junior Researchers, Students, Postdocs, and, and um, etc. And in 98, um, honours, he was uh, elected a member of the European Molecular Biology Organization. In 2005, he was elected as a fellow of the Royal Society, and in 2020 to the US National Academy of Sciences, so the National Academies of the UK and the US. John won the Paul Marx Prize for Cancer Research in 2003, the Louis Jean Tay Prize for Medicine in 2016, and the, the Gardner, Gardner International Award in Canada in 2019. So um, thank you, John, for, for doing this and for overseeing these papers. It's a great pleasure to have you speak um, and, and kick off uh, tackling SARS-CoV-2 biochemistry. Thank you. Great. Thank you very much, Mark. Can you all see and hear me? Everything's good. Everything's good. Great. Okay, well, um, I guess I, I first want to start by thanking the Biochemical Society for organizing this. I think it's a really great thing for all of us to kind of uh, bring sort of an end to what's been a very challenging project. Uh, I also wanted to really uh, thank the Biochemical Journal for publishing these papers, and I guess reiterate what Mark said it's a great journal uh, and they didn't ask us to do things that weren't necessary to get the papers published. So thank you very much, Mark, and also Daria Lessi, who, uh, who was involved in this as well. Uh, and then I'd also like to thank the Francis Crick Institute because it was a lot of the um, facilities uh, and personnel here that we used quite a lot during this, this uh, period. So I'll just start with those few thanks. Okay, so... Um, 
Uh, I guess the COVID-19 pandemic is is not a surprise to anybody. It's been an atrocious thing. Uh, over 200 million cases, uh, four and a half million people have died from it. Um, and at this point, back in March 2020, we decided, my lab and I decided that we really wanted to try and do something positive during this, so we're, where we could actually use our expertise. Uh, and so we set out to try and identify some small molecule inhibitors of the enzymes that are encoded by SARS-CoV-2 uh, as potential antiviral drugs. And really, we had a number of goals. We wanted to a number of reasons for wanting to, to isolate small molecule inhibitors. One is to be able to exploit these chemicals ultimately as tool compounds to study the biology of the virus, to identify drugs potentially for repurposing, uh, to identify lead compounds for further drug development, uh, and also to identify synergies between inhibitors, inhibitors for some no, potentially novel therapeutic strategies. So I just wanted to start with this overview of the SARS-CoV-2 genome. Uh, I think you can, let me make my laser pointer here. I think you can see uh, up here that um, the genome is about 30 kilobases and the first, uh, you, you probably know this spike protein here, S, is encoded by this last third of the genome. But what's really striking is this massive open reading frame, ORF1A, 1B, which really encodes uh, two proteins, one 400 kilodalton protein from ORF1A, and then a 700 kilodalton protein from a, frame a program frame shift here that encodes ORF1A and 1B. And um, these, this massive protein gets cleaved by two protein proteases that are encoded within it, NSP3 and NSP5, into 16 um, what are called non-structural proteins. And these really have all of the enzymatic activities that are involved in, uh, in replicating the virus. So there's a whole bunch of enzymes encoded. There are actually nine of them. Uh, two of the proteases I've already mentioned, NSP3, part of the NSP3 protein and NSP5, and you'll hear from Kang Wei and Jennifer about the screens that they did. I just want to note that in addition to uh, processing the polyprotein, the NSP3 protein also has um, isopeptidase activity against ubiquitin and ISG15, which is probably important in innate immunity, in avoiding innate immunity. There's a mono ADP ribosylase. I won't say much more about that. There are two uh, cap methyl transferases. So these put methyl groups on the five prime cap of the messenger RNA. And this is important for translation efficiency, but it's also important for evading innate immunity. There are two nucleases of uh, slightly unknown function, I would say at this point. Berta will tell, talk about the screens that are for these two. And then finally, there are two replication enzymes, the RNA helicase and the RNA-dependent RNA polymerase. So I just want to make a, a point about um, the evolution of the virus that I think is quite important in this. So this, uh, this little figure actually shows where the mutations were in the first major variant that came out, the so-called alpha variant or the Kent variant. What you can see here is that most of the changes are in this spike protein and in some of the other structural proteins. But in fact, in, in terms of the uh, replicative part of the, uh, the NSPs, there's virtually no mutations in it. And so actually these non-structural proteins are very highly conserved among, among uh, coronaviruses. They probably can't tolerate a lot of mutations. And um, they're all mostly essential for the virus life cycle. And Raquel will tell you a little bit about uh, her cell-based assays that looked at this. And so uh, antivirals might not just be useful for SARS-CoV-2, but might actually be useful against other coronaviruses. And as Mark mentioned, you know, we need to worry about the potential vaccine-resistant variants coming out. So the project was to express and purify all of the proteins uh, in E. coli and bacula virus uh, to characterize the enzymes and to develop assays that would be suitable for high throughput screening, and then to screen an in-house compound library that had uh, more than 5,000 established pharmaceutical compounds. Uh, and then we characterize these uh, from the screen and then uh, test the, the best hits in viral growth assays. So I'm going to just quickly go through one screen, uh, the screen that we did uh, for the RNA-dependent RNA polymerase, just to give you a sort of a flavor for it. 
Um, so we purified the proteins. We expressed various different combinations of these three subunits in insect cells and E. coli, finally settled on an active version. And this just shows an assay looking at RNA-dependent RNA polymerase. So we start out with this substrate that's a primed a small primed oligonucleotide, and when it gets filled in, it makes this double strand, completely double-stranded molecule. And I think you can see here that with time, uh, we get a uh, product uh, accumulating. But this kind of an assay is really not very useful for screening thousands and thousands of chemicals. We needed to have an assay that would work in a high-throughput format. And so uh, to do this, and this you'll see this kind of approach in, in all of the screens today, uh, we used a, a FRET-based assay in which we have a, a fluorescent dye and right next to it a quencher. So this part of the molecule, the primer template, is pretty much the same as I've shown you already. And the idea is that as the RNA polymerase extends across, it can displace this oligonucleotide with this five prime flap. And when this oligo is displaced, that allows the Psi3 to fluoresce. And so we read that as a positive signal. Uh, and as this just shows here, some uh, a titration of the enzyme showing that the more enzyme we put in, the more activity we get. And it makes the point that we, we can do this as a kinetic assay, so we can calculate natural velocity, enzyme velocity from this. So we did this uh, in a, a high throughput screen against all five plus thousand of these compounds. And this just shows the, the primary data here. You can see that most of the compounds up here and all the controls uh, basically didn't inhibit the activity, but you can see a few of these dots down here, a few at the low concentration, a few more at the higher concentration, uh, inhibiting the enzyme activity. And I'll just show you an example of one of these. It's a compound, it's, an, it's actually a drug called Suramin, it's used to treat river blindness and other things. Uh, it turns out to have a, a fairly good IC50 of less than one micromolar. Uh, this also makes the point that the presence of detergent doesn't change the IC50. And this was an important lesson we learned in the screen, that a lot of the compounds aggregate uh, and can give you non-specific inhibition, uh, but, but real inhibitors aren't affected by the presence of uh, detergent. And this just shows using that gel-based assay that Suramin is in fact a very good inhibitor of, of, uh, of the RNA-dependent RNA polymerase. So I'm not going to go through this table in detail. If you want to look at it, it's in, in the group of papers that were published earlier this year. It's a list of all the inhibitors that we found. And just to make the point that these inhibitors range from uh, sort of natural chemicals like dihydrotanchinin, which you'll hear Kang Wei talk about, uh, to some existing drugs like um, uh, for example, suramin, which is used to treat sleeping sickness, um, and trifluoroperidol, which is uh, an antipsychotic. So there's some some uh, characterized drugs, and there are some less characterized chemicals as well. Um, and almost for almost in almost each case, we identified more than one inhibitor for each enzyme, which will be useful in terms of toolbox. Um, and in almost every case, these, these drugs also inhibited viral growth, which is what Raquel will talk about at the end. So just to summarize, this was our goal, was to, to screen these molecules. Uh, we now we think we have this set of uh, compounds that will be useful uh, tool compounds to study the virus. There are some potential interesting drugs for repurposing, uh, lots of lead compounds for further development, and I think Jennifer will tell you a little bit about that. Uh, and then finally, this idea of identifying synergies between inhibitors, I think, is an interesting one. And one of the things that we did was to test each of the drugs in combination with the only really accepted uh, antiviral remdesivir and found that one set of them, the NSP14 methyltransferase inhibitors, did have some synergy with uh, remdesivir. So that's really everything I wanted to say. This was a massive project. It involved... Um, 40, 40 odd people, 35 of them from the Crick, a number of people from Dundee, uh, most of them from the MRC uh, PPU there. Uh, and it was, a, it was a sort of a once in a lifetime thing that I don't think I'll ever forget. It was stressful, but it was also incredibly gratifying. So I think I'll stop there, thanks. Thank you very much, John, um, for that, um, that inspiring tour through uh enormous amount of, uh, of effort, that's, that's terrific. And just, just to remind people, <clears throat> um, uh, the slide is up, um, for questions for John, 
and and for any of the speakers if you could submit them in the question box as, as shown here and just specify for whom the question is and then we'll get to them at the end so <clears throat> excellent thank you so <clears throat> let's um move to our second speaker second speaker is, is um is jennifer milligan jennifer is originally from fife in scotland and joined john difty's group um at the quick institute in 2018 to start her phd her PhD project is mainly focused on um, studying the mechanisms of chromatin replication using an in vitro system of purified proteins. That's what she does when she's not working on SARS-CoV-2. During the pandemic, however, her focus was switched, as John just described, to the entomology of SARS-CoV-2 replication and discovering, validating, and optimizing inhibitors against it. Um, and uh, Jennifer will tell us about a part of this project identifying the uh, 3CL protease inhibitors. So welcome uh, Jennifer and look forward to hearing your talk. Thank you for the introduction and uh, thank you to the organizers for the opportunity to speak today. Um, so I will be talking to you about one specific portion of this larger project and that was the identification of inhibitors for the main protease, the 3CL protease from SARS-CoV-2. So just to keep a, a brief introduction, just to remind you, but uh, the first two thirds of the SARS-CoV-2 coronavirus responsible for COVID-19 encodes all of the 16 uh, proteins responsible for viral proliferation, prol proliferation um, all of which are excised or cleaved from the polypeptide uh, from which they are produced by two viral proteases. The papin like protease, which Cam Wei shall discuss, cleaves out NSP1 through 3, so non structural protein 1 through 3. And then the main protease, which is a chymotrypsin uh, related protease encoded by NSP5, cleaves out the remaining six, uh, four, NSP4 to 16, at 11 conserved cut sites uh, throughout the polypeptide. So, towards identification of inhibitors, we first optimized a purification scheme that would arrive at a uh, pure, untagged, unmodified uh, protease, 3CL Pro, uh, quantities good enough for screening. And we then wanted to assay activity of this protease. And one method that we did this was the development of a fusion protein designed from one of the non structural proteins, which is not super important, but we used NSP9 here attached to a flag his epitope, so something that was fairly chunky uh, for size, um, cleavable by uh, one of the consensus cut sites from the polypeptide, which I mentioned previously, the one in particular that we used being the junction between NSP4 and 5, which is the one predicted to have the highest affinity for 3CL Pro. So on the addition of 3CL Pro, this uh, fusion prote protein is cleaved, into two products which are differentiated differentiated by size so they are suitable for analysis over an SAS page gel because we can see the two products so on the first lane uh, we have no uh, TCL pro and just substrate and you can see that this does not cleave and then in the presence of 3CL pro and increasing over time you can see an increase in product and decrease in substrate However, uh, this gel-based assay was not suitable for high throughput screening. So as John mentioned, we developed a FRET-based assay for protease cleavage. And in this instance, we have a fluorophore attached at one end of a short peptide with again, a 10 amino acids from the NSP45 cut site. And at the other end, we had a quencher. And when this peptide is not cleaved, the fluorophore and quencher remain in close proximity to each other. And so there's no fluorescence. And then on the addition of the 3CL protease, uh, the peptide is cut and the fluorophore and the quencher, the distance between the two is increased and so there's fluorescence uh, as there's cleavage. So we managed to scale this up uh, for a high throughput um, capacity and uh, we could also measure the course of the reaction over time, so the slope of the reaction or the rate and because we can look at thousands of compounds, we can then look for compounds that re reduce the slope of the reaction or the rate of the reaction by a certain amount. And that's just what we did. So here I show um, a diagram displaying the normalized 
rate of reaction of all of the drug compounds, which was over about 5,000 um, at the highest drug concentration that we screened. And you can hear that we, you can see here all of these dots underneath, which were compounds which seemed to reduce activity by at least 30%. So it was a, a bit more over the noise of the reaction. We got about 27 compounds from the initial uh, primary screen, so 5,000 down to 27. Um, and these were put forward for validation, which I'll just talk through briefly. So we removed the uh, compounds that interfered with fluorescence. And what I mean by this is, is they artificially increased fluorescence. So they reached saturation of what we could measure quicker. And so they artificially had a low rate of reaction. So they were kind of false positives. After we went through that, we had about 13 compounds, which we could then do a secondary screen for. So this is in the threat-based assay. Um, but over a wide range of concentrations and any real inhibitors would be reproducible in this and we could uh, calculate IC50 values. We got 12 uh, compounds which we could do this for. Then we sought to validate these out with a threat-based assay. So we used gel-based assays and it's as I just described to make sure that out with a threat <clears throat> assay they could still inhibit and we only have five from here. So 5,000 down to five. Um, and then we made sure they were specific for 3CL Pro by testing against other proteases, uh, the PL Pro protease from SARS-CoV-2 and a pan protease, just like thrombin. And here I have shown the four final compounds here. One being a calpane inhibitor, calpane inhibitor one. And you can see that they all inhibit at all concentrations tested. So calpane inhibitor and also calpane inhibitor two and 11. Um, which are inhibitors of the calpane proteases, um, were also identified around the same time to inhibit uh, the 3-cell protease in vitro. Um, so I'll just be talking about our other type of inhibitor that we identified. <clears throat> and this was um, all fluoromethylketone peptide-based inhibitors, um, which were all initially designed to inhibit caspases. So all of these, uh, FMK small peptide inhibitors had very, very good uh, potency against 3CL Pro. And in fact, they were in the no, low micromolar range for IC50s. <coughs> and they had a similar, similar general structure of a, a, a Z uh, cap at the end to help with cell permeability. A short uh, peptide targeting sequence, which generally mimics the protease um, active site for the proteases that they were designed for. And then a warhead molecule or a functional group, which would covalently bind to the active cysteine residue in these cysteine proteases. And in this instance, that would be, um, <clears throat> uh, that would be um, a cysteine residue in here. So we wanted to see if we could increase the specificity for 3CL Pro by changing or altering these inhibitors to improve them, given that they were designed against other proteases. So to do this, we looked at the sequence with highest affinity. Um, can you still see my screen? I have an internet problem. You're a little bit fuzzy with the mic. Yeah. We can, you can see your, your slide okay, um, but you, yeah. you're, you're, and here you're okay, but you're, you're, your face is a little bit um, low resolution. That's fine, you don't need to see my face. Um, so we looked at the sequence again for the NSP45 cut site, and we compared the inhibitors that we got in the screen, and we saw some similarities by property. <coughs> so we then designed uh, three custom inhibitors, but this time using the uh, substrate sequence, which was from the, uh, the cut site of 3CL Pro with the highest affinity. One important point to make is that, that we couldn't, due to synthesis, have a glutamine uh, here, so we have an aspartic acid here at the P1 position. And so from this, we designed three inhibitors with the same protective group, the same functional group, but differing by amino acids in the peptide targeting sequence. And we validated these and tested them as we did with the previous compounds. And we found that the shortest of all of them had the best uh, inhibitor capacity with <clears throat> and IC50 in the low nanomolar range. However, these drugs all have one major issue, and that's um, 
when they're digested by the liver, they re release some pretty toxic byproducts. Um, so they're not suitable in this format for uh, drug use, but they do serve as an important tool for further development. <coughs> and this is as their kind of Swiss army knife type of the, the design that is, cap that is um, possible, i.e. you can change the cap to uh, facilitate synthesis and cell permeability. You can, as we demonstrated, uh, change the targeting peptide sequence. And also, you can alter the warhead or the functional group and swap it for non-toxic alternatives. And we did do some work towards this, and we found an alternative to, alternative to FMK, which is the <coughs> difluoro-phenomethylketone uh, group, or OPH, which we tested and we've listed in our publication. And it did have some inhibitory effects against 3CL Pro in vitro, um, with, which would serve as a good starting point for further drug development. And so with that, I would just like to highlight again that this was just one part of a huge collaborative project, and there were many people involved, but I just wanted to acknowledge people specifically who helped with the uh, protease, and this was Teresa, my co-first author, who did all of this with. Those uh, from the peptide chemistry SDP at the Crick, which were brilliant in helping us design and synthesize the custom peptides. Those from my own lab, who helped greatly with protein purification, assay design and optimization. Um, high throughput screening, who helped us make it a high throughput screen and dispensing, dispensing the plates. Uh, Raquel from uh, the Cell um, Infection Laboratory, who will talk about the cell-based assays and those from Dundee who helped with protein purification. And lastly, I'd like to thank the organizers and the audience for listening. And I'm going to end it here. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jennifer, for a very nice and very clear talk. It was impressive work. Um, <clears throat> good, excellent. <clears throat> and again, if you have questions for, for Jennifer, please submit them through the question box as shown on the screen right now. And I can direct them to, to Jennifer at the end of, of, the, uh, of, of the session. So our next invited speaker is uh, Dr. Kangwei Tan. Um, he's from Malaysia and um, obtained his PhD at the, in Japan at the Nara Science and Technology Institute, um, where he was working on uh, replication fork slowdown under checkpoint conditions in E. coli. <clears throat> he then came to the UK and um, worked at the Gurdon Institute at the University of Cambridge <clears throat> for a postdoc in Philip Zegerman's lab where he was um, uh, studying how phosphatases regulate replication initiation, initiation in budding yeast. And uh, now in John Diffley's lab um, <clears throat> at the Crick, he's focusing on reconstitution, when he's not working on sars cov this is, he's focusing on the constitution of replication using in vitro approaches. <clears throat> and, and as you will hear, during the lockdown, he joined the team um, to, to help screen for inhibitors um, of, uh, of, of SARS-CoV-2. Um, so uh, your slides look great, uh, and everything looks good, and look forward very much to hearing your talk. Thank you. Yep. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Kang Wei from, DC, from the DC lab. So thanks for the introduction and the opportunity to present our work on this uh, webinar. So I'm going to talk about the antivirus compound screening for the NSP3 pepin light -like protease, which is one of the seven papers that we published recently. So uh, I just want to mention that this work is equally contributed between Chu Tengli and me. So as a reminder, so PL Pro is encoded within the NSP3, which is the largest NSP in the SARS-CoV-2. So to research on the PL Pro, we use the truncated version that covered the U, uh, UBL2 and the PL Pro domain. It also has been used in the previous study. So we express and we purify the PL probe from both the bacteria and the insect cell system in case the different post translation modification is important. We then develop an uh, in vitro protease assay and we found that the protein purified from the bacteria are slightly more active and therefore this was chosen for the subsequent experiment. And in this slide, I will explain in more detail on how the in vitro assay was set up. So as a reminder, PLPO is known to cleave the viral polypeptide to produce NSP123. And the rest of the NSP was produced by the main protease um, NSP5. So 
So also as um, Jennifer has explained, we utilize the flat technology to visualize the substrate cleavage activity via the PR Pro recognized sequence. PR Pro is known to cleave after the sequence LXGG. And once the cleavage occurs, the fluorescent signal is released and this can be detected by the plate reader. So we observe the substrate cleavage reaction in the short peptide that contains the boundary sequence in between NSP223 but not NSP122. And this reaction rate can be significantly increased by using a bit longer substrate. And then having the in vitro ASA developed, we then use it to screen for the PL Pro inhibitor using the 5000 library from the high throughput. So we pre incubate the incubator with the enzyme before the addition of the, uh, of the substrate. So this is a time cost experiment where we could follow the reaction happen in the real time rather than just the endpoint result. And, uh, and a representative of the normal reaction with the reaction containing a positive. Um, inhibitor are shown here. So we want to search for the good inhibitor to inhibit the enzyme with a low concentration. So in the screen, with just above one micromolar of each inhibitor, eight inhibitors was isolated out from the out of the five thousand, and they shows inhibition rate of at least twenty five percent. We then repeat with the screen with the higher concentration of the drug, and we obtain more heat as expected. Next, we develop a second assay to validate those HIP. So this is a gel-based assay instead of the fluorescent base, where we construct the PR Pro cleavage site on a much larger protein. And so that the, the cleavage product can be visualized on the SDS page gel. And indeed, the heat that we got from the screen also stopped the protease cleavage in the gel-based assay. We included some of the non PR Pro inhibitor as a positive control, and they stop PR Pro activity at the various degree. We have to exclude some of the inhibitors, even though they inhibit uh, the PR Pro. And this is because they also appear in the other screens, and therefore shows the non-specificity. And finally, this assay efficiently rule out the false positive hits from the screen, as they did not inhibit PR Pro in this child's based assay. And we find out that this is due to the autofluorescence issue. So after all, the candidates was reduced to just a few, which is easy to handle. Finally, we determined the IC50 of those inhibitor with a wide range of the concentration. So they are dihydrodangino one um, RO082750, and the beta lapachon, and they have IC50 less than one micromolar. So with dihydrotangsinol 1 being our best hit, we also tested some of the tangsinol derivative. They are not present in the screen. So they also show IC50 just above one micromolar. We include a non PR Pro inhibitor, GRL0617, to see how does this look like under our experimental condition. And it has IC50 close to two micromolar. So from this screen, we found some good inhibitor that inhibit um, PR Pro with the nanomole scale of the IC50. Next, we wonder whether those inhibitor are general protease inhibitor that could also inhibit 3CL Pro, the main protease in the virus, which is also a cysteine protein just like PR Pro. So we tested those inhibitor on a similar gel-based assay, as Jennifer just explained, for the 3CL Pro, with the cleavage product visualized on the SDS page gel. And, and novel 3CL Pro inhibitor, ZVAD FMK, that is discovered by the screen, effectively stop the 3CL Pro activity. However, none of the PL Pro inhibitors stop the 3CL Pro even up to 10 micromolar. So from this, we concluded that uh, those inhibitors are specific to the PL Pro. So interestingly, PL Pro cleavage site LXGG is not only found on the virus protein, but also present on the human protein, such as the, uh, the ubiquitin and the ubiquitin like protein, ISG50. And in this oversimplified diagram, when the virus attacks the hot cell, ubiquitin and the ISG50 are known to conjugate to the target protein as part of the signaling pathway that finally trigger the immune response. 
So reversing of this process by the PL probe, therefore, has been suggested as a viral strategy to suppress the host immunity. So we did the test to see if PL probe is capable of cleaving the polyubiquitin. The answer is yes, as we observe cleavage of the trimer into the dimer and the monomer. So when PL probe inhibitors such as uh, beta lapachon and the dihydrotanxinol one was added into the reaction, this activity was largely inhibited. And the same observation was obtained on the ISG15 experiment. So in summary, the PL probe inhibitor that we, dis that we discovered not only stopped the viral replication, but also has the implication in restoring the host defense system. The dihydrotanxinol one appear to be the best inhibitor in our screen. And it is a natural compound isolated from the salvia madoriza, uh, as John just uh, mentioned, which is a traditional Chinese uh, medicine with a long history of usage. So together with the dihydrotanxinol 1, cryptotanxinol and the tanxinol 2A are also isolated from the same plant. And they share the similar chemical structure and show a comparable IC50 towards PR Pro. So in fact, we also did the cell culture based antivirus, antiviral polyfication assay for the SARS-CoV-2. And we found that only dihydrotanxinol 1 is effective against the replication of SARS-CoV-2 with the EC50 of about 8 micromolar. So I think the next interesting question is to find out how dihydrotanxinol 1 bind and inhibit the PL probe. And this has been proposed by a reason in silico study. So with this, um, I just want to say thanks to Jones who initiated the whole project. And also, he's also the supervisor in my lab. We, we always thanks to the high throughput screening for the 5,000 inhibitor. And for our project, um, we want to thank peptide chemistry for the substrate. And I also like to thank everyone else who joined the other six screens. So thank you. Great. Thank you very much, Shang Wei, for that um, very nice presentation. Really um, superb work. Um, good. Um, and again, don't forget, if you have questions for Kang Wei, please um, submit them um, through the, uh, the question box uh, that we've described um, several times. And if you can see on the right of your screen right now, um, good. And we'll, talk, we'll um, put, pull them together at the end in our discussion section. So let's move on to the um, to the fourth um, talk. So the, the the next invited speaker today is um, Dr. Berta Canal, who's a molecular biologist, did her PhD in the laboratory of Francesca Posas um, in Barcelona, where she studied uh, mechanisms that coordinate DNA replication and transcription during S phase to pre pre prevent uh, genomic instability. She then moved to the Crick um, for her postdoc. Uh, where she obtained a Marie Curie um, fellowship to study how DNA replication is regulated in response to stress using biochemical approaches in the laboratory of John Diffley and in her spare time has been working on SARS-CoV-2. So it's, slides look good, everything looks perfect. So um, welcome Berta and look forward to hearing your talk. Thank you Mark for the introduction and hello everybody. Uh, among all the um, enzymatic activities of uh, SARS-CoV-2, the virus encodes for two nucleases, an exonuclease and an endonuclease. And we managed during this uh, big project to screen for inhibitors of both nucleases. And today I'm going to talk about uh, the work we did to uh, identify inhibitors of the exonuclease that is composed of NSP14 and NSP10 proteins. The virus encodes for the NSP10 cofactor and the NSP14 bifunctional enzyme that has exonuclease activity and methyl transferase activity. For the exonuclease activity, NSP14 has to combine with NSP10 and form a complex in order to, to have this exonuclease activity. It is not a common trait of RNA viruses to have exonuclease activities. Uh, it has been proposed that, that this exonuclease activity present in most coronaviruses uh, serves the virus to uh, uh, evade the immune uh, reactions from the hosts. 
And also interestingly, it has also been proposed that this exonuclease activity can uh, serve as a proofreader of the virus so that it would um, help correct the errors that the RNA polymerase might uh, make during the genome duplication of the virus and that this proofreading activity might have been involved in the enlargement of the genome uh, that is characteristic of coronaviruses that have one of the largest genomes among the RNA viruses. Interestingly, our uh, supposition at the beginning of this project was that if we were to find uh, uh, inhibitors for this exonuclease activity, we would be able in one hand to uh, maybe cause the accumulation of some sort of uh, RNAs in the cells that would be recognized by the immune system and that would help with the reaction against the virus. And also, if we could interfere with this exonuclease activity with an inhibitor, we would also mess with this proofreading uh, capability and maybe affect the, the, the growth of the virus. So the first thing that we wanted to do is to purify the protein as it has been shown for the other projects. And the key that has been shown by others and that our preliminary data uh, suggested was that uh, it is not that easy to uh, purify active NSP1410 proteins that have good exonuclease activity. And that uh, the key for this exonuclease activity was the stability between NSP14 and NSP10 complexes. So we decided to do an alternative strategy, strategy and to fuse both proteins and purify a fusion protein. We developed an assay based on previous knowledge from SARS-CoV-1 exonuclease in which uh, a label template of double-stranded RNA would be, uh, be cleaved by the exonuclease and the cleaved products could be then visualized in uh, denaturing polyacrylamide gels. So using our purified fusion protein, we performed this assay where we could visualize the substrate and the cleaved products in uh, such gels. And interestingly, what we saw was that our fusion protein was very active, a lot more active than uh, what previous purified problems, uh, exonuclease proteins had been shown in other um, projects. So we decided to use this fusion protein to uh, perform our screen. The other key aspect of the project was to develop an assay though that instead of being run in a gel could be uh, assayed uh, in solution so that it would allow us to monitor exonuclease activity over time and without the need of a gel. As it has been uh, explained by John at the beginning, what we did is to place a quencher close to our fluorophore and that upon cleavage by the exonuclease of this uh, double-stranded RNA substrate, the quencher would be released and we would be able to monitor fluorescence appearance. Using this, this substrate, we were able to monitor uh, the activity of NSP1410 exonuclease over time to uh, calculate slopes of the reaction and with this estimate enzymatic activity. When we perform these reactions in 384 well plates containing the different compounds of the chemical library, we then would be able to measure slopes in the presence of each of the compounds and look for compounds that reduced the slope of the reaction, which could mean that they were inhibiting our exonuclease. We performed the screen and analyzed the slope in the presence of each of the compounds in at two concentrations of the compounds again, and identified some compounds that were reducing the activity of, or putatively reducing the activity of our assay. And we identified uh, some more compounds at higher concentration of the compounds. We curated all the results in order to produce a list of uh, primary hits from the screen and decided to validate these hits using the gel-based assays, which we uh, considered was more a more direct way of monitoring exonuclease activity. Just to remind you, in the gel-based assay, we can visualize the substrate and the cleaved products when the enzyme is present, when we perform these reactions in the presence of the selected hits from the screen, what we saw is that most of the hits did not alter the activity of uh, the NSP1410 exonuclease in this assay. However, patulin and orin tricarboxylic acids, two of the compounds, did inhibit 
the exonuclease activity of NSP1410 in this assay. So to further characterize the uh, uh, exonuclease activity in the presence of uh, patchouline, what we did is to assess uh, NSP1410 exonuclease activity in the presence of increasing concentrations of patchouline, uh, which allow us to monitor uh, to quantify uh, or to calculate, sorry, uh, half maximal um, inhibitory concentration of patulin that was of 1.8 micromolar. Um, patulin is a, a cyclic lactone that is produced by uh, molds, especially in rotten fruits such as apples, and it has been shown to be a mycotoxin and to have antibiotic uh, effects. And also, unfortunately, to be a, a highly cytotoxic molecule. So, because of its toxicity, we uh, don't anticipate that patulin might be a very good uh, inhibitor to treat COVID-19 per se, but it could be very interesting to study derivatives of patulin or structural analogs that might help understand how the enzyme uh, can be inhibited. And also maybe to use patulin in in vitro assays in order to further explore uh, the, the biochemistry and the, uh, the, the, the function of the SARS-CoV-2 virus in uh, research projects. Regarding the ATA inhibitor, we also calculated the IC50, which we found to be a little bit higher than the one of patulin, but still in the low micromolar range. ATA um, is a known uh, nuclease inhibitor, so it, it has been shown to inhibit other nucleases such as RNase-A and benzonase. However, when we compared the inhibitory uh, role of ATA over uh, RNase-A and benzonase and compared it to the one of NSP1410 exonuclease, we found that ex, uh, NSP1410 was inhibited at much lower concentrations of ATA. So there was a window of uh, opportunity there compared to these other nucleases. Interestingly, ATA has been shown to be an, an antiviral uh, compound against other viruses such as SARS-CoV-1 and the Zika virus. And this is intriguing because uh, Zika virus does not have an exonuclease like uh, SARS-CoV-1 or SARS-CoV-2. So overall, all this uh, uh, knowledge about ATA suggests that this compound uh, might have uh, effects on different compounds. So it could uh, be inhibiting, for example, NSP1410 exonuclease, but it might have uh, roles in inhibiting other important uh, factors, for example, in the host cells, uh, that could help uh, in an antiviral uh, role. So we believe it's an interesting uh, drug to further explore, especially considering that it's uh, very low toxicity. To finish with uh, this part, I want to uh, acknowledge and to thank uh, especially uh, Alison McClure and uh, Joseph Curran that are co-leads in this project with me, the whole lab, of course, and all the people involved in the project, people in the creek and people in the University of Dundee, all the facilities in the creek and the funders and all of you for being here and for your questions. Thank you very much, um, Berta, for a um, really very nice description of that um, really cool work. Good. Um, thank you. Um, so and now, um, again, if you have questions um, for Berta, um, please do submit them using the box that you can again see on the screen and we'll come to them after um, the last talk. So let's move on to the, um, the, the final talk um, of, the, of, the, uh, of the webinar before we get to questions. Um, which is um, our last speaker is Dr. Raquel Ulfer, who will um, tell us a bit about the virological aspects of this and, and the effects of the compounds on SARS-CoV-2 replication. So Raquel got her PhD in molecular virology from Queen's University Belfast um, for work on replicative enzymes of SARS-CoV and related um, corona and NIDA viruses, NIDA viruses. And she then worked on picornaviruses and influenza viruses to get more uh, virological expertise at Utrecht um, University, and, and then uh, was then at the University of Cambridge, and is now at the Crick in London. And um, her work includes assay development for screening antivirals, identification of antivirals that target replicative 
enzymes as well as host factors. And she's currently interested in the host factors of influenza and coronavirus, as, as you'll hear a bit about in just a, a couple of minutes, in and in particular, membrane trafficking pathways with a focus on autophagy. So um, your slides look good, and I can see you clearly, Raquel, and I look forward very much to hearing about your work. Thank you. Okay, um, well, thank you very much for the kind introduction, and thanks for uh, organizing this um, very interesting webinar. So um, I'm here to now talk to you about um, a high content microscopy screen for inhibitors of SARS-CoV-2. Um, as you've heard from John and um, his colleagues, they'd come up with really this amazing array of different inhibitors for these seven different replicative um, enzymes and thanks to Berta for this very, very lovely depiction that you three have seen throughout. But the question was now really, um, would these inhibitors that they'd identified in vitro also work in a virus infection, at least in cell culture, this being the first hurdle um, for then any antiviral? So if we're looking at developing a high content screening assay for inhibitors of SARS-CoV-2, what are we looking for? Well, as minimal handling and high containment as possible um, is helpful not only for safety reasons, but also because due to all the um, safety requirements, it is rather slow, um, the work that you do there um, for a sort of similar reason potential for a maximum automation and at the same time be able to prize apart whether it's actually antiviral activity we're looking at or cytotoxicity um, that this compound um, causes. And sort of just briefly as to what kind of methods are current uh, commonly being used for, uh, for those kind of assays. Um, not necessarily all of them. The first being for a virus that, like SARS, causes a so-called cytopathic effect, so it kills the cells. As you can see here, the cell culture infectious doses, CCID50, um, which um, there's little chance of automation. I mean, I've spent uh, more time than I would care to remember in reading these out under microscope, um, while the sample is largely remains infectious, it's not exactly fast, and you would still require a separate readout for toxicity because that's your endpoint um, for the virus. Then, well, a currently standard used assay, um, generally PLUG assay to quantify, can also be modified, um, shown here, the PLUGs, the white points. Some automation possible but limited really has a high amount of handling and it would take three to four days for visible plaques for this virus. Now qPCR you're probably all familiar with very early on um, it was possible to um, well to to have an essay to quantify that it's arguably the most direct readout of replication. Um, there's because you are looking at RNA, the automation is possible but limited, but you have a lot of processing steps and for this level it really becomes very expensive because the reagents are very expensive. Now one that we were particularly interested in is an antibody-based detection of viral products with potentially a fluorescence readout, though you could use other methods in this case. However, the snack being, well, antibodies against a novel virus. I mean, it takes time to produce these. And um, taken from sort of one of the early descriptions, um, it certainly is a novel virus. It's distant enough from SARS-1. Um, however, overall, there is still a good enough um, similarity be or between the on, on the protein level. So we reasoned that uh, we could very likely use SARS-CoV-1 antibodies that would then cross-react the SARS-CoV-2. And as you can see here, um, that panned out, we tested a variety of either non-structural or um, against structural proteins. Now, one sort of the odd one out um, 
there are antibodies that were generated against a plant virus that will detect double-stranded RNA. So this is something that so far most uh, RNA viruses do appear to make a surprising amount of. So this could be used. We were particularly pleased to see that this um, antibody against the nuclear capsid CR3009 worked um, for the following reasons. So this was an antibody from a panel that was described and isolated against um, SARS-CoV-1. And um, our colleague at UCL, Laura McCoy, um, had the expertise and the foresight to clone these um, antibodies. And then we're very fortunate here at the Crick to have um, what we're calling the service technology platforms. And Sven Kier from the Structural Biology STP could rapidly produce large amounts um, of this antibody um, that could be directly labeled. So it became cost efficient. And this is um, the general setup of this assay that we came up with. So you would have um, your cell of choice, um, add a dilution series of drugs, then add the virus to this, and this part growing the virus, and this would still be done in the high containment facility. Um, and then fix the sample, and at this point, the virus would be inactivatedly safe to take out of the facility and um, can then stain for the virus with this antibody and for um, the nuclei as a simple readout um, of cell number and therefore toxicity and analyze this by uh, microscopy. And again, luckily, Mary Wu has, from the high throughput screening STP has access to all kinds of um, very fancy robots and equipment to automate most of these parts, um, including the automated high content microscopy. So, and this is what this looks like. Um, this is screening at 5x. You can see the infected cells, several foci at 20x. You would find, um, well, you can start telling the individual cells. However, we found that um, at, this was something that Mary worked out at 5x magnification, this was sufficient to really analyze um, this just simply by looking at the green positive area and quantifying that, which made this very fast for screening purposes. And as proof of principle, now you've heard this mentioned before, at that point, um, pretty much the only one available, remdesivir, the drug that works on the polymerase by being incorporated. Um, and as you can see, um, we got EC50s in the low micromolar, depending on the experiment, um, which is in good agreement with the high nano to low micromolar range that has been described in the literature. Now, going back to um, just some examples of the um, ones that we tested. So, first of all, um, the one Berta introduced, the inhibitors of NSP14 um, exoribonuclease. So, patulin as well as um, ATA were found to inhibit the virus in cell culture. Um, John, as he mentioned, was particularly interested in whether there would be some synergy um, at that point with remdesivir. Um, most reason to think that that might be the case for the exoribonuclease. Um, however, in this case, we did not find any synergy. So the inhibitors of the NSP5 main protease, so calpine inhibitor, had been previously shown to inhibit the um, SARS-1 MPRO, but no data on whether that would, this would work in cell culture. And as you can see, it works with uh, really low EC50. Um, then this elegant series of main protease inhibitors um, with the modification. And again, um, while sort of the original one, um, that sort of 
very low activity, there was some improvement of this and certainly further room for further improvement. However, also no synergistic effects with remdesivir. Now for NSB3, the papain like protease, um, dehydrochantinone also worked out um, to work very well in um, cell culture. However, as you can see, cryptotanchinone and tanchinone, um, so the similar molecules that had been described previously to work in vitro and which um, were confirmed to work in vitro, really no effect in um, our assay as far as we can see, showing that's really important to follow this up. And then also um, the other inhibitors um, showing sort of reasonable EC50 values, so good starting point for further development. Um, with GRL being described, pre having been described previously. Again, no synergistic effect with remdesivir was found here. Um, and well, this is one of the reasons why I bring up an additional screen. So as John mentioned, um, there are these, a lot of these viruses, um, well, basically they provide their own capping enzymes, one of them being NSP14. And um, the series of inhibitors that were found to inhibit and work quite well in cell culture. Um, here, the value from the previous without remdesivir shown in red, you can see that there is some improvement um, if we include remdesivir in this. So just as I said, a brief overview. And um, if you're interested, um, all the other ones are published. And um, well, as I said, it was a large consortium, so thank to everybody. It's uh, really amazing work and very exciting. Um, but just for sort of this particular, for the screen, um, I want to particularly point out um, Augustina Bertolin, who basically coordinated um, the uh, between the in vitro work and the in vivo work. Um, and I've mentioned Mary Svend, um, the WHO Influenza Center, which help, um, helped with their expertise on working in a CL3 environment. And um, as I said, Laura for providing this antibody, which can be obtained here. And thank you very much for your interest and I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you very much, Raquel, for that um, comprehensive view of the of the um, uh, the uh, the key findings of what these drugs and um, potential drugs can do. That's terrific, excellent, um, good. So, um, so that's the last of our um, scheduled talks. So now we um, can have some questions. Um, so uh, we welcome questions for the speakers. We have a few of them, and as mentioned, if you have questions for the speakers, please pop them in the box that you can see um, on the screen. Okay, um, good. So um, so thank you. So all the speakers are now back um, and, uh, and I will um, share some questions. So just um, to, um, to, to start, um, there's a, um, Daja Demineva had a, a general question, which was, um, Given the conservation of the non-structural proteins, could antigens in them, presumably processed, be used as potential vaccine targets um, in, in, in these cases? Has that been done? So, John. That's a good point. Um, I think the real problem with that as a concept is that they're never outside the cell. So um, they're, they're intracellular, they're expressed only, only in cells. So I don't think, I think antibodies obviously work best against the structural code proteins. But, but, but if there's enough protein, and what I was thinking when I was looking at the question was that if they're processed and presented by MHC, and so mm. forth. Um, could that be? Could, could there be a, effectively a neo antigen mode for them to be um, exposed? Yeah, I, th I, yeah, I think it's not. Uh, it, it's it's probably a, a legitimate thing. 
I think it's also worth saying that there are lots of other proteins on the coat of the virus that haven't yeah. even been exploited yet, which I think sure. uh, would be worth thinking about. Because unfortunately, the spike protein is the one that evolves the fastest. Sure, indeed. Good. And yeah, I, and uh, sorry, maybe ahead. just to come on to that. So, I mean, they've certainly, you can find that um, if you look in the blood, people will produce antibodies against other structural proteins, also against some of the non-structural proteins. But as John pointed out, it becomes a question of sort of as a vaccine, how, um, I mean, the people are working on this, but um, the spike certainly is sort of the most prominent target. And the average cell, I think, will have very few of the NSP antigens presented on its surface anyway. But good, so th thank you very much. Um, so another quick question from Asha Tavari, which uh, is the question um, uh, for the NSP1410 fusion, um, the question about um, whether the exonuclease activity becomes more active um, than, um, than the, the it, it, does the fusion enhance the um, exonuclease activity of NSP14 directly? But I get, yeah, I mean, I guess I'll just chip in something, which is that there's there's two issues. One is that the complex between NSP14 and NSP10 isn't very stable. So so there's some element of the fusion simply helping the uh, the complex formation. Uh, I don't know if Berta wants to say something else. Whether there's really a direct effect on the nucleus activity, I, I don't know. Yeah, well, I agree. I don't know either. One thing that I wanted to say regarding this instability of the NSP14 and 10 complex when they are alone is that it's supposed to, uh, in cells, to form a complex with the other proteins, NSP12, NSP7, 8, etc., to make like a replisome complex. So the idea of fusion them together is to, to keep them close because we believe or th there is the suspicion that this instability of the complex is not a normal thing either. So it's, it would be a, a non-physiological a non thing anyway. So we thought that we might be losing some inhibitors by fusing them together, maybe something that would impair NSP10 to be close to NSP14, but still uh, we might be winning some other things because having unstable complex would be uh, problematic. Yeah, I think it's, it's interesting too that NSP10 is a small protein, but it's also a cofactor for the other cap methyl transferase, NSP16. So it may be, as Berta said, that there is some higher order complex that gets formed that helps stabilize everything. I think it's a really, I think one of the things that's amazed me coming into this whole thing is how little how little we actually really know about the replication of coronaviruses and mm. how much there is to learn. Right. One, one other thing that I didn't explain is that what we did once we had the fusion protein is to assess methyltransferase activity because in theory having or not NSP10 around, uh, NSP14 should be able to have methyltransferase activity anyway. Uh, we did the test in this regard using, uh, so uh, SAS and TIF that were involved in the methyl transferase uh, screening managed to assess methyl transferase activity of the fusion and they saw that there was a, 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 a normal comparable methyl transferase activity of the fusion. So this was not affected. Sure, okay, great, thank you. And next I have a question from Mark Duffy. <clears throat> a question for Jennifer, which is, um, what are the next steps for developing the uh, the warheads, the new warheads, the OPH, I think, warheads that you had identified, and then what are the prospects with that? Well, the development of the OPH uh, peptide inhibitors would be an exciting project, but it's not really in the scope of what we're doing anymore. Um, it would involve some kind of novel chemistry as the addition of the OPH group to the peptide uh, linker is not, not is not simple, especially if you wanted to make the additional improvement of having the glutamine in the P1 position. Um, so that in itself would be a very interesting chemistry 
endeavor as well as creating what could be a very useful and novel drug and i would implore anybody who wants to have a go at it to try um but that would really in my opinion be a really cool next step um you could try the fmk warhead with the q in p1 to see if there's an improvement and then try for a non-toxic alternative there are others not just oph that just happened to be the one that we could source commercially in a inhibitor that we could test yeah okay. thank you and, and good Maybe part. I add something that you know you do we're kind of out of this business now a little yeah. bit um but all of the all of the reagents are available to anybody who wants to take any of this on all the constructs are available at adgene uh, and we're available for consultation on any of this if anybody's interested and it kind of related to that, another question actually from mark duffy for, duffy for raquel which is um are there plans to look at synergistic effects with the latest promising antiviral um molnupiravir or should mark do that <laughs> So, um, I mean, I've, it's certainly possible, we've not directly planned uh, doing these, but yeah, I think, um, especially given that we saw very little um, synergy with sort of any, like especially the exonuclease uh, compounds, um, I'd be very curious to see whether a different ribonuclease, uh, sorry, um, a different polymerase inhibitor would make any difference there. Um, and also the mechanism then behind that would be very, very interesting to unravel. Thank you. And and actually, <clears throat> um, also for you, for you, Raquel and, and John, um, Blair Strang was asking <clears throat> whether you'd, <clears throat> excuse me, I, I attempted to generate drug resistant virus mutants. And I think just summarizing the question, I think that the idea is that um, if you put them on, um, if you put the virus under selective pressure, it, will you actually, even though they're well conserved proteins, will you get do you, will you get mutations in the non-structural proteins? That's a great question, and I guess that's a sort of a generation two kind of experiment. I guess before you go anywhere, you'd want to know how easy it is to get revertants or or, or resistant mutants, uh, but we didn't, we haven't done that. Good thing. Um, good, and then um, I think, and then I then I think the final question I have here on my list, I had a couple of quick ones I want to ask um, too, was um, for Berta from Vidyada um, uh, Ducks was had you test tested or has anyone tested patchylin on the cellular um, counterpart enzymes? I I don't I'm not sure I understand the question. Um, but, but I think just in terms I think it's really a matter of I think the question my sense is that, that that's all I have my sense is that the question may be about selectivity um, um, versus um, cellular related cellular enzymes. Um, so I don't know. One thing we tested is uh, how patulin might inhibit other nucleases apart from the NSP1410. I think, that's, so we tested... I, think that's the, I think that's the question. Okay, so yeah, we tested whether patulin was a general nuclease inhibitor and it might also inhibit uh, RNAs A or benzonase. And what we found is that not up to 50 micromolar. We didn't okay. test further from that, but we didn't observe any inhibition of these yeah. other nucleases. And what we saw in the cell-based assays that Rachel and Mary did was that there was some toxicity as it had been reported. So whether which are the targets there, I don't know. Okay, great. And, and I had a question for um, also for, for Kangwei and, and other protease people. Um, you know, thinking about synergy that you'd seen with uh, uh, Resdemavir, um, is there any, do you think this, there might be selective synergy for subclasses of, of targeting effects effectively? I guess what I mean is that do you think, uh, could it be that targeting multiple proteases, for example, would give you more synergy? Um, and, and in a sense, to, and I, I guess related to that, is there, is there a sense that the, um, that the, the proteases do actually 
cooperate in any way or are they entirely independent? Yeah, it's a good question. Because I think in, in, in both protests, we don't see the synergy effect between the Rendell okay. Civil and the protest. I mean, in biology, you may think that they work on the same pathway. That's why we don't see any additional effect of this drug. But what I was more thinking is if you did, if you did, if you hit multiple proteases, would you be more inclined to see um, synergy? That was really my question. Yeah, yeah, I think absolutely. I mean, that was one of the purpose that we want to find a specific drug for each enzyme. Yeah. And then if we combine all of them, and then we are able to, to kill every pathway in the replication um, of, this, of this virus. And then this is definitely a, a very good idea that, that we, we also want to do. Okay. Yeah, can, I, can I actually add a couple of things to that? One is that, um, you know, we, we, we had remdesivir, that was the only drug we had at the beginning. So that's why we tested everything in combination with that. But I think there's definitely a piece of work going ahead where we test all of the drugs that we've gotten in combination with each other. Yeah. Uh, I think that's a really interesting project. The second thing that I wanted to say is that um, we did all of these uh, inhibition experiments in vero cells, and Raquel knows more about this than I do, but I may want to say something, but they have a very poor innate immune response. And one of the interesting things about all of these inhibitors is that they might be predicted to generate intermediate molecules that might trigger innate immunity, like uncapped messages, partially replicated uh, molecules. And I think that there's a, a whole body of work that would be very interesting to do in perhaps cells that have a slightly better or stronger interferon response or, or general innate immune response. I don't know if you want to say anything about that, right? But I think that would be an interesting way to go. Any other comments? I, I have a comment on that. I did not explain anything about the screen of NSP15, which is the endonuclease. This is the only uh, one of the enzymes that we screened that we found a putative heat, heat in vitro, but that did not show any activity in the cell-based assays. And one possibility could be that because NSP15 has this major role in immune evasion, it could be that we did not observe any inhibition in the cell based assays because video cells are not responding to that. But there is a window of opportunity for that, I think. Okay. And can I just ask one, one final question, which is that you know, there's been a plethora <clears throat> of in silico screens for um, potential inhibitors of these enzymes. And, you know, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm an experimentalist. Um, and I, I, that's what I need to say about that. But but I was surprised back in the HIV protease days that Pat Kuntz and others managed to get very good protease inhibitors of HIV protease through DOC, DOC and so forth. And I was wondering if any of you have, have actually looked through the in silico screens for overlap with what you saw with the cl compound classes that you looked at, or or are they completely disparate? Is there is there any connection? I think Kang Wei mentioned that dihydrotensinin uh, came out of an in silico screen. Is that right, Kang Wei? Yeah, yeah. I think, yeah. Tensionin is okay. generally. So I think there, there is some, you know, there is, has some success rate with that. Having said that, we've also uh, been contacted by lots of people who've done in silico screens and. Yeah, I imagine. Have, We've tested lots of their uh, compounds and we've not yet found anything that's uh, inhibited. So I think it's, you know, I, I think it's, it's, it's a good way to go, but I think, you know, you, as you said, the experiments are important too. The proof is in the pudding, I always think. That's why I'm an experimentalist. But <clears throat> we, anyway. we, we did a sort of comparison with in silico screens that had been published for NSP15 because it was the, the screen that had less hits. So what we did is to compare what was known, what was uh, proposed. And we found that some of the predicted inhibitors ranked quite high in our screen. So some of them seem to be uh, also uh, high in our screen. And these inhibitors uh, were also RNAs A inhib inhibitors. So, uh, they, they seem to be uh, general nuclease inhibitors. Okay, okay, good. Okay. This is in the paper. <laughs>
Right, great. Th thank you. And I'm, I'm being <clears throat> asked to wrap up since we're pretty much out of time. So I'd like to to thank you all very much indeed for for fabulous talks of a, of a summary of what has been extraordinary work. And, and thank you for publishing in the Biochemical Journal also. And, I, and, and also thank, thank the audience um, for coming and for their questions. And as you'll see on the um, slide at the moment, feel free, please, to continue the conversation online um, with the different Twitter handles that you can see um, on here. So, um, so, so I'd like to, I just once again to thank everybody for attending and again to thank the, uh, the speakers very much um, for doing really a terrific job. I think it's been a really exciting webinar. So, thank you. Thanks. And if you have enjoyed today's session um, and then um, <clears throat> and would like to know more about the topic, you should definitely take a look at the, uh, the collection on the on the website. Um, you can see it uh, right here and you can, um, in, in the uh, in the journal from a short while ago. And you can in our group of, of seven papers with a perspective and so on and so forth. And going forward, um, we welcome suggestions for future topics and speakers to feature in this Biochemistry Focus uh, webinar series. So if you have an idea for a webinar in 2022, please um, submit a proposal and you can see online uh, at the moment um, how to do that. I'd also like to mention that if you have missed any of the 30 odd set, uh, webinars that the Society has run as part of, and Port and Professor run as part of this series, or would like to watch them again, you can visit the website or the YouTube channel. You can see those on the right, those links, um, so you can actually look um, look at, go back and digest this one um, too. And um, at uh, www.biochemistry.org um, forward slash webinars. And then I'd like you to just um, advertise the next one. So please join us next time for a biochemistry focused webinar series entitled um, SPRNA Seek um, Challenges and Opportunities. Um, which will be held on Thursday the 28th of August, sorry, Thursday the 28th of October um, at 2 p.m. British um, summer time, is that? Um, right, uh, I, I, I used to be in Britain, but I can't remember what BST stands for, but BST, um, and doing this session, chaired by, this session is chaired by Professor Helen Whedon at the University of Glasgow, and the speakers will induce the most popular microfluidics approaches, 10x, <clears throat> and also outline the main steps of uh, standard SCRNAC analysis. And you can register now for this um, free webinar. And then just as a final point, I just want to um, make a, um, a comment um, about the Biological Society that, you know, particularly during these times when, you know, as you can see from the speakers, we're stuck in our various offices and homes and Zooming from places the connections we get from something like the Biochemical Society are really important. Um, if, whether you're a student, a postdoc, faculty, um, or none of the above. Um, and so join. Um, and, um, <clears throat> uh, and you can see, you can find out more at biochemistry.org forward slash membership. Um, and, um, and it can join the big international um, group of biochemists represented by the Biochemical Society. So I think that's what I wanted to say. And just, I want to just finish again by thanking everybody for attending. And in particular, for thanking John for leading this sterling effort, which has been quite inspiring, I have to say. It was really a great pleasure to handle the papers for the Biochemical Journal with Dario Alessi, and to see them come out and see the journal get a chance to publish something that's really very important for all of us, and and to 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 Raquel and Berto and Kangwe and Jennifer um, for giving all terrific talks um, uh, after John's today. So I think that's it. And thanks again. And keep up the good work, everybody.